Welcome to Giving an Answer, the show dedicated to defending the restored Christian faith. I am your host, Harold Felder, and today is a continuation of another show that I had called Raising Children with a Biblical Worldview, and I have two guests. My first guest is Shannon Lee. She is 15 years old. She's a sophomore in high school. She is the daughter of two proud parents, Minister William Lee and Christina Lee. She is an honor roll student. She runs high school track. She has a love for reading and listening to Christian music in her spare time. She also has three brothers and two younger sisters. And her mother, Christina Lee, is a native of Oakland, California. She now resides in the Charlotte area here. She is president and founder of Nehemiah Training and Consulting. She has a ministry, <laughs> and that ministry, Nehemiah Consulting, is, a, is dedicated to teaching Christian leadership principles, fundraising development, evangelism, and Christian apologetics. She is now also a student at Southern Evangelical Seminary. Welcome, Shannon and Christina. Thank you. Thank you. And I've had you on the show before, but I want to tell those who haven't seen the show before is that the Lees have basically adopted me since I've been here. They invite me over for all the holidays, mm -hmm. and they are constantly feeding me. So I just wanted to let people know that these are really, really good people. So good to have you back on the show. Good to be back, thank you. And I'm gonna, just for people who didn't see the first show, I'm gonna ask a couple questions to just sort of set the stage. And because we, we were talking about you know, raising children with a biblical worldview, and we're gonna have Shannon talk about you know, what that actually looks like in a child. Okay. But for you, the first question I wanna ask you is, is, well, first of all, why should we train our children to have a biblical worldview? Well, it's real important, Harold, that um, children understand the importance and the relevance of our faith. Um, and as a parent, uh, my main responsibility, I say, is threefold. Uh, I'm responsible to make certain that I lead my child to Christ and to truth and all understanding, okay? Secondly, it's my responsibility to make certain that they have food, clothing, and shelter. And my third responsibility um, is to make certain that they get the proper education so they become independent and be able to be a well, law-abiding citizen. You know, and, and those are the three uh, common goals of every parent. And I think if we stick to those common goals in love, we'll produce some wonderful, God-fearing children. Okay, so that's why we should. But how do we? How do we prepare our children to have a biblical worldview? Well, we do that by being a Christian role model in front of them. And I don't mean just going to church. Uh, it's more than going to church. Uh, your life has to be immersed in the Word of God. Um, you have to really take time to understand why you believe what you believe. Um, the Lord has to be the anchor of your life. And the decisions that you make in your home have to be made based on the precepts of the Word of God. So, you know, in order for you to flesh this lifestyle out, you have to have a true desire, you know, a true desire to really want to serve Him as Lord. And when you have a true desire, and particularly as a woman, to serve him as Lord, uh, and particularly when you're married, that means that uh, submission to your husband and, and raising your children in a godly fashion is the most important thing, even before our careers, that is the most important things for women to remember as our role in the home biblically. Okay, so let's turn to you now, Shannon. So Shannon, tell us what type of role models are your parents? Um, my parents are very good role models. They're very, very loving. Um, my father is the head of our household. Um, he's, he's working and he's very, very strong in his faith. Um, he loves us like he loves Christ. As for my mother, she's a stay-at-home mother. Um, she works for Nehemiah Training and Consulting. You know, so, so she's there when I get home from school for my homework basis or for any questions that need to be answered. Um, my parents are always there for us when we're in trouble. Um, you know, they always keep us on track with our word. So they're there, you know, they're role models and they, that's how I want to be when I grow up. All right, great. Now, this is one of the practical, some of the practical questions because people say, well, okay, so you're, what does that really look like? What are some of the, the practical details of, of, of how you actually raise a, chi a child with a biblical worldview? So Shannon, what are some of the boundaries that set for you as far as for TV and the internet and all that type of stuff? Well, they really aren't as strict as people probably think they are because of mom and dad are ministers. Um, they're very, um, they all depend on you know, what, what we do, where um, our thing is based on a biblical standpoint. Um, as far as TV, we don't watch things that aren't glorifying to God 
or that don't represent us in the female body. Um, the radio, some songs aren't just Christian, like, you know, we don't listen to things, like I said, that aren't presentable to us as the female. Um, internet, same thing, basically. Okay. So, but you, you feel you have freedom, but there's a lot of things that you just, I mean, I guess because of what they've instilled in you, you just don't want to do a lot of things that other kids are basically involved in that aren't glorifying to God. Yeah, it's, um, it's just one of the things that I know I'm not supposed to do because that's just something that, you know, my mom and dad have instilled in me, like you said, you know, it's just nothing that I don't do. So do you have any influence? Well, how do you influence your peers? Your because you're you're in high school, and you know high school students are known for doing some. I mean, I know when I was a high school student, I was doing some things <laughs> that definitely wasn't drawing fine to God. So, so how do you influence your peers? Um, well, I'm a positive influence on my parents, um, my my friends. Um, I try my hardest to set an example um, because you know uh, people say the first impression is the best impression. Yeah. Um, I like to stay modest in the way I dress, for one. Um, you know, the latest fashions aren't really the best thing because that sometimes can lead you away because of the new fashions, you know, the tight jeans, the low-cut shirts, you know. Um, that's just something that I'm not caught up into. Um, as far as conversational basis, when we talk about the little in conversations that come up about, you know, homosexuality or our sex basis, um, I stick to the truth, you know, I just let them know, well, what would Jesus do, or this is in the Bible, and usually the conversation stops because, you know, who wants to argue with God? Well, that's what I want to do then. I want to ask you some of these questions, some of these controversial topics, and see what your opinion is on them, uh, because we know that children are all over the place, or, or youth are all over the place with these ideas, because they've been really influenced by a society that is, that is anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-biblical. So what is your view of sex? Um, sex is made out of marriage. Um, God made it for um, a male and a female to do out of, out of love and marriage. Um, it's not for um, one to do just because they lust each other or they do it because that's what's in, you know, in high school. Um, you find a lot of that in high school. A lot of girls just do it all because he's cute or because he says he loves me when he really doesn't, you know. He just does it because that's sometimes what a male instinct is. Well, what is your view on abortion? Um, abortion is wrong. Um, it's killing God's creation. Um, when a male fertilizes an egg in a woman, you create it a human being and when you kill that person you've killed you know God's purpose you have killed somebody who could have been a testimony for somebody else um, you know you don't you know just go around killing people that's what I mean that's what I believe for example um, my mom was carrying me and she had they thought that she, they thought that she had a miscarriage um, but she didn't but the procedure was that if she did have a miscarriage, they were gonna have to take me out, and it was something like an abortion. And so, if they didn't have a second thought and come back and check, they would have taken me out. And so, they didn't. So now I'm here now, and I'm telling my story how I would have been aborted. And so, you know, just the thought of them trying to, you know, aborting me is testimony to somebody else. So, you know, I thank God for that. Well, I didn't know that. That's a good testimony right there. Of, uh, yeah, it, it is an awesome tes testimony, and, and she's right. You know, when I was carrying her, they thought I had miscarried, and um, they had actually scheduled uh, a, a process that they take women through medically, and um, I, it was just the providence of God. I was actually there in the hospital waiting for the procedure to be done, and a senior um, um, physician came through with a group of residents, uh, students uh, from a nearby college, and they said, hey, can we experiment on you for a second? We just want to show these residents uh, this procedure that they're getting ready to perform on you. And, and um, of course, I said, sure. And they asked me why I was there. And I said, I miscarried. And now they're going to um, go forth with the process to uh, remove the child. And uh, he said, well, can I take a look? And he started looking. And he goes, wait a minute. I think I see a heartbeat. 
and uh, that was Shannon. And I think at the time I was probably only about four weeks gestation uh, or five weeks gestation, very early in the pregnancy. And um, Shannon's life was spared, and so she's right. Uh, they would have, uh, unfortunately, by, by accident, aborted her uh, because she was alive. And uh, so it is a great testimony. And I'm glad that she understands that from a biblical worldview yeah. that that would have uh, definitely been devastating um, uh, to me as, as well as to the audience that's sitting here listening to her testimony. And because, you know, because you invite me over so much, I've gotten to know Shannon and I've, and I've met some of her friends and I see what type of a positive influence she has on her friends. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder, you know, what, what would have, what would their lives be like if Shannon hadn't been that influence that she's been in their lives? You know what I mean? There's this, there's this domino effect that we all have on each other's life. Absolutely. I don't think people Absolutely. take into consideration. So Shannon is truly a gift. Yeah. Truly I've a seen y'all have like Bible studies at home yeah. and stuff like that. But, but what about you? What do you personally do to stay rooted in your faith? Um, I pray a lot. Um, I don't think it matters to me where I'm at, what I'm going through, or what the situation may be. Um, I always pray, and I, sometimes I always pray just to get closer, you know, just some simple prayer, you know, Lord, I want to be closer in my walk with you. Um, I read books um, such as the book Stand with, um, by Dr. Alex McFarland. Um, I attend the um, Dare to Share program once a year. Um, I'm also reading a Greg Steer book. Um, so, you know, I, I like to read and pray. Um, I have my family Bible study, like you mentioned, and we all sit around and we we take time to say, well, this is what I've done this week and I want to repent. And when I do that, um, I feel like I'm getting closer with God because He's omniscient and He already knows what I do. So, you know, when I confront my sins, I feel like it's a, a, a closer bond with Him, so. Okay, now this is, this is okay. I, I know there's someone out there listening wondering, well, this is, this is okay, this is all good. And well, because you're living with your parents now, you're under their roof. They're being, you're being scrutinized by them. But what happens if you know when you go to college and your freshman year, you're no longer at home. Mama's not looking over your shoulder now. And you meet that guy, that cute guy. And you were talking about cute guys. You see this cute guy. Now he's not necessarily a Christian. What happens then? Well, first I want to say that um, I will never throw in my faith. Um, my parents have instilled so much in me and I would never throw away something that is that valuable to me. Um, not just because of, you know, it's my parents, but because I want to be close with the Lord. Um, I want the Lord to bring somebody to me that's equally yoked. Um, you know, somebody who was like me in Christ, somebody who'll be there for me when I need help. Um, somebody who is just, you know, well, you know, if you need somebody to talk to, you can talk to me. You know, somebody who's not just there, um, to be at my house late at night, you know, somebody who's there in a Christian standpoint. Um, as far as me getting in a relationship with somebody who was not of the Christian um, outlook, um, as cults, as far as Jehovah Witness and Mormons, um, you know, God says to love everyone, so it's not like I wouldn't like them. I mean, we'd be friends, but there's no probably no chances of us getting you know, into any serious relationship. Okay. Seems like you've trained her well, but you have experienced that, that because you have another son who's in college now. So tell us about that. I do. And I'm, I'm just, you know, it's just mind blowing to watch his faith um, and to watch the life that he lives um, on the field and off the field. And, um, you know, the other day he played in a real big game against USC. T and, tell us. I, um, most people don't know, but your son plays football. Tell us about. He plays college football. Right, right. And um, he played in a, a real big game against uh, University of Southern California, which um, the, the game was, was kind of a, a big game in the sense that they were David versus Goliath. And um, the papers, you know, quoted him as being a deeply religious man. And he made this wonderful quote that, uh, you know, the Lord knew that it was going to happen. It was, it was foreordained and, you know, predestined to happen before I was born. And, and then he went on to give the story, the, uh, the, the um, commentator went on to write the story about how um, he gave everyone in the locker room, each player, a stone. And the stone represented David uh, slaying the giant. And uh, needless to say, um, 
You know, he ran a 70-yard uh, punt return back and had a real big game, and, 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 and they won the game. Three weeks later on ESPN, they're still talking about the David and Goliath, and they're still talking about the stones uh, that he gave every kid in the locker room, still talking about his faith. And uh, last week he called and told me that um, someone in Milwaukee called him and said they wanted to bring him on the television show to talk about his faith. Wow. Nothing more rewarding, nothing more rewarding than to see a young man who lives his faith uh, in front of everyone. And my husband went to the USC game and, and many of the adults and the leaders in that community um, stated that, you know, he goes home after the games, he doesn't party, he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke. He's just a great role model um, on and off the field. Um, he won the Pac-10 Academic Award for Excellence in a Student for Academics. Just, you know, really doing a great job. Goes to a great conservative evangelical church right. where there's great male leadership. Uh, you know, rented a car, took my husband to church that Sunday that he was there. You just, you know, you couldn't ask for more. You couldn't ask for more. And so when I see kids being produced like that, uh, even my children at home, um, I had a son yesterday came in, uh, my son Isaiah, and he had done some things wrong. And, and he said, you know what, Mom, I was convicted at school, and I just want to come home and tell you I'm sorry. What a blessing, mm. you know, to hear um, your child, a nine-year-old, say that he was convicted of his wrongdoing. You know, that's powerful. That's yeah. really powerful. Yeah. You were talking earlier, and you used the S word, the, the submission word. And I, now you're a strong African American woman. I know you. Mm -hmm. However, you use that submission word in relationship to the relationship between you and your husband. How does that play into how you raise your children? Well, it's it's very important, and it's very important that Shannon and Danielle and Aaron uh, see me um, submit to William. Um, because they one day, if the Lord brings someone into their life, and, and I say that um, very candidly because um, there are too many women thinking that they are definitely supposed to be married, and marriage is not a prerequisite for salvation. Um, <laughs> and, and so they, that's a very difficult for us to, in this modern culture, uh, we believe that everyone should be married, but the, the Bible says that he that findeth a wife finds a good thing. So that means that if you're not found, uh, your, your job may be to be married to the Lord. And that's very important because we're raising our kids um, to think that marriage is a prerequisite uh, after college, and that's not necessarily the case. But in the event that they do get married, they do need to know how to submit. They do need to understand what godly submission is uh, and respect and reverence in a relationship. Uh, my sons need to see it so they can know what type of wife to pick. Um, that's very important. Um, William is the head of our home. He is the decision maker. He is the one who uh, fulfills the charge that God gave Adam. He goes out and he works for his family. He brings home the paycheck. He pays the bill. Nehemiah, if it was up to Nehemiah, we, we'd all be in a homeless shelter because Nehemiah does not pay the bills. Right. Uh, uh, William Lee pays the bills. Right. And, and, and I don't forget that, and neither do I allow these children to forget that. And that's part of the, the, the submission of a wife. We have to give credit where credit is due. Yeah, but okay, and that's good, and that's great, but what about the single woman who's listening right now, the single woman who doesn't have a William, who was trying to raise godly children with a biblical worldview, and, and she's being torn between work and, and, and her, her obligations to her children. She gets home, and she's tired, she's worn out, she's got to make you know, dinner for the kids, and, and how does she raise a kid with a biblical worldview. That's, you know, that, that's very difficult um, from the standpoint of her being alone and the challenges that come al alongside of being a single mother. It's very difficult. Um, but it's also, and I want to point this out, and I've shared this with Shannon many times, it's also a consequence. Uh, if that child was born out of wedlock, that, that, that raising that child and that struggle was a consequence of the actual sin of fornication or premarital sex. Right. So I want to say that the, the child is a blessing. So there is going to be some struggle there. But in order to get through that struggle, I think that the best thing for that woman to do is to submit herself under some good male leadership at a really good biblically sound church. Right. That is the most important thing. Um, 
Secondly, she herself needs to be anchored and brought up in the word by other women in the church whom are at the point where God has um, allowed them to go through trial and error so they can somewhat bring her up in the faith uh, and, and rear her so that she can in turn uh, rear her children. Uh, and, 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 and third, I think the elders of the church and the deacons of the church can, and particularly if it's a male child, can wrap their arms around that child and take him on uh, outings such as golfing and bowling and basketball games. I think the church has to be more instrumental in the lives of the people whom are in the congregation who truly need the help. Yeah. And so uh, alongside the church, and, and, and definitely her walk with the Lord. And they could, there can't be any compromise. Uh, my mother was a single parent. My father left our home uh, when I was a young age, uh, probably somewhere between the ages of uh, eight and nine. My mother did a spectacular job raising me. I never woke up, my testimony, never woke up and Uncle Willie was at the house. Right. Uh, I never had a, a, I never remember my mother dating anyone. My mother's role was to raise me in a biblical environment. I never ever, if she had a boyfriend, he was hidden and tucked away because I never grew up and seen uh, that type of behavior in front of me. And so uh, my mother was very strict. Um, I was 19 years old when I met my husband. He was not allowed to even sit in my room. He had to sit in the living room, very strict, very, very strict on the way that she raised me in the faith. That's important. And I think those principles and those guidelines that she put in, inside of me and instilled in me, I carry them today and I've imparted them in my daughters. And so that, that, I think that, that going back to what we knew uh, from our four parents who did a much better job raising children than we're doing today. Yeah, and I know you're going to uh, Southern Evangelical Seminary for apologetics. Mm -hmm. So have you been teaching your kids about apologetics? I know the answer to that, but the audience may not. Absolutely, you know, my children once a week, we do a Bible study. And um, one of their, one of their, um, um, responsibilities in that weekly study is that they get vocabulary words. Um, you, you heard Shannon earlier talk about the word omniscient because that's yeah. one of the words that she, she has had. In God, you know, and she learns that God is immutable. And why, why is that important? Because as she reads the text, I want her to be able to pull out God's attributes in the text so she'll know, gee, this is God promising me in his word that he'll never change, he's immutable. You know, that's wonderful to me that these kids can go beyond um, simply just um, a small mere understanding of what God is saying to a deep, you know, trained, well thought out word of, of, of what God is saying. That, to me, that's just awesome. Yeah, because I've been over your house and you've actually asked the kids their word for that week and they were able to, like you said, big words like omniscience, you know, that the average adult does not know. So that's pretty impressive. And I know that uh, Shannon was telling me how she, how you read your books and she wants to read the same books that you're reading. And they're seminary books. They are graduate level courses. And so that's very encouraging. So but why do you think that's important? I mean, for someone their age, someone, you know, who's preteen or teenage to, to, to grasp these deep type of uh, concepts. It's important because we live in a, in a world that has, as, as well as I am trying to impart deep godly concepts in, the, in them, there's a, a whole nother side of, of darkness that is trying to, to plant deep concepts in them that are unbiblical. And so it's my job, you know, if you want to fight the devil, let, let's fight the devil with something theological. You know, let's let's stop naming and claiming stuff. I don't I don't want my kids somewhere in a prayer line trying to name and claim a car, a house, or a husband. I want my children understanding what the word of God says. You know, maybe it's not maybe it's not in God's plan for you to live in a 3,500 square foot home. Maybe God wants you to be on the mission field. And and you know, and I want them to be able to read scripture and be able to ask the Lord, Lord, what is it your will for my life, and and how will this play out? I mean. How does she allow the Lord to bring a godly mate in her life? How can she choose if she doesn't understand biblical principles? Those words are important because um, um, her being able to defend the historical Christian faith is important to me. You know, because when the, when the fine guy comes around that's nation of Islam, yeah. I want her to understand that other than sharing her faith with him, don't, you, you cannot marry him. 
you are not equally yoked. You are not serving the same God. You can't then raise Christian children because the house is now divided. How can you submit to someone that's not under the same authority that you're under? Yeah. It's, it, it's a domino effect when we do that. And I'm not picking on the nation of Islam. I, that goes for Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, and anyone else that does not see Christ as the true and living God, that they don't believe in the death, burial, and the resurrection, and that Christ came and died for our sins, and that he will be back. And if we do not accept him in the pardon of our sins, unfortunately, you know, there'll be a big crowd in hell, and hell is a real place. It absolutely is. It's a real place. Believe it or not, we've come to the end of the show. So I want to thank you, Christina Lee, Shannon Lee, coming on talking to me about raising children with a biblical worldview. And that is the end of this episode of Giving an Answer. Be sure to join me again next time. And until then, goodbye and God bless. Oh,